it's very interesting to see and i believe that in reality especially when you run deep and something now in order for for a good scoop preparation you want to look into these spots and if you find a two find a three turn uh, uh table in a in a big tournament i think when a lot of money is at stake it's really worth pulling the trigger and being a little more aggressive in these spots and not just to wait for your aces and have a good setup against kings and play it comfortable. Of course, it feels like shit busting in a big tournament and bluffing there with eight high, but this will happen. And if you're not willing to take those risks, then please also don't expect to run deep or don't cry while you constantly uh, start the short stack on final tables and you never make a final table in the first place. You always bust final two, final three tables. Welcome my friend to today's study session. I'll be reviewing a very interesting hand that I've played last Sunday on Party Poker in a $5,000 tournament. But before we're gonna jump into the action, I wanna make you aware of the sale that is going on right now on Raise Your Edge. We want to guarantee that you guys are perfectly prepared for the upcoming tournament series, the Scoop on Poker Stars and the Knockout Series on Party Poker and we provide you with a discount of $300 for the tournament master class the expert level and $160 for the apprentice level if you want to study the bounty uh, the bounty course or yeah if you just want to get better in bounty tournaments they're going to be a shitload of bounty tournaments we provide you with a $300 um, sale or discount for the bounty basis as well and for our unchained the, the mindset course we provide you with a $100 discount. If you think that you're lacking in the area of mindset, if you wanna improve your mindset, if you wanna get your tilt under control, and if you wanna learn about techniques and tools that you can incorporate in your routines in order to play with a higher level of focus, to not start tilting so quickly, and simply to have a stronger mindset in poker, but not only in poker, but also outside the tables, then you should definitely check it out. But let's not spend too much time on the sales. So if you guys are interested, head over to raiseyouredge.com, check out the courses, and then let's jump into the action now. I would guarantee that most of the people that would see the hand would think that this is a huge punt, you should never play it like this, you should wait for good hands, but I'm gonna explain you why I believe this is a good play. And I'm also really happy to see that I actually didn't play the hand so bad because in game it definitely feels, it feels bad when you make a play and it doesn't work. But let's look into it. So first of all here, I think at this point in time we were around, I don't know, 40, 45, 35 players left and around 20, 25 people were paid. So it's not really, bubble but it's getting close to the money and we're playing against this uh, small blind here who i think is a regular i mean the stats he plays 23 17 so he seems to be a very solid player and now we have three options no actually two options i mean we have three options we could go all in but that doesn't really make any sense we could race or we could check and i want to first of all look at the in-positions in um, players respond. And this is how you should play the spot in theory. Of course, this is not applicable and you should never try to incorporate an identical strategy in your game. You should try to simplify it. And bottom line in this spot is that you should be raising very polarized. So main takeaways are here. Of course, we wanna raise our stronger hands like all that hands that can play for stacks, king, queen suited, king, drag suited, clear raise for value. And with these kind of hands, I would make it very player dependent whether I want to stack off. Against most high stakes players, I would definitely be raise calling these hands because most of the players can limb shove all these weaker pairs and when they could get good price, they could be limb shoving some suited king x hands. We perform well against the off suited aces and they would certainly slow play some aces kings or even raise some ace kings preflop. And then of course, since limb shoving is can happen with a very high frequency, we want to be check 
checking backhands like suited aces, suited broadway, suited connectors, also with a very high frequency because it would be, yeah, a waste of equity to raise for these hands. However, a hand like queen jack suited or a hand like ace eight off, well, it also benefits a lot of folding out a hand like jack six off that villain is completing or folding out a hand like nine six off or seven five off or nine three suited. It's still a lot of equity. So don't only think about the equity that you get denied, but also think about the equity that you are going to deny by raising those hands. But in general, we should be raising very, very polarized. A hand like jack five off, jack four off, 10 five off really benefits of um, him folding him out a lot of equity, a lot of better hands like queen five off, queen six off, queen seven off, all these sort of hands. And you only in invest three big blinds to win. Uh, actually, it's uh, two and a half big blinds to win 2.87 big blinds. So my standard sizing is here around three and a half big blinds. It's always between three and a half and uh, four big blinds. And depending on the on your opponent, of course, um, he will fold 30, 40, 45% of the time, which is huge. So actually, we don't need much fold equity, but he will ha have all these weaker hands. He will have limp hands like 9-5 off, queen-5 off, jack-4 off. And this is a huge portion of his range. And he really can't, re even he's getting a decent price, he he's out of position. He has a worse equitalization than we have in position. So he has to fold those hands. So... That's why even in theory here, even though our opponent is, as you can see, uh, sorry, this is out of position. This is what he's supposed to be limb calling with. So he's only folding these bottom off suited combos, this, the weakest suited combos and everything else that he limped, he's continuing with. You see these uh, frequencies here because some of the queen jacks he's raising pre and 0.46% of the time he's going to um, yeah, limp and call a raise. And the other amount, the other times he's going to raise it pre-flop. Um, so you're playing a mixed strategy here, but also for the, if you're out of position, the reason I would approach is like, okay, I'm going to um, ma mainly, um, let's say I'm going to raise King Jack off 100% of the time, going to limp Queen Jack off 50% of the time, or sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to raise King Jack off 100% of the time and I'm gonna limp queen jack of 100% of the time. I would just, I would not try to apply those frequencies for single hands. I would just try to distinguish between each hand. So if I see that these suited jacks, we wanna be sometimes raising, sometimes limping, I say, okay, I'm gonna raise jack five suited, jack four suited 100% of the time, the other suited jacks I'm, I'm raising. That's how I approach it. Even that is really difficult to incorporate, but that's where I'm trying to what I'm trying to aim for. In general, blind versus blind, I always try to make it very player dependent uh, based on the reads I have on them, based on the stats, check check their race first in from the small blind. You can add a stat like limb fold versus, um, limb fold versus um, big blind eyes race. But also um, since huts might get uh, eradicated from playing, I think on party poker soon, um, then you just simply follow a, a somewhat game theoretical strategy. Try to keep in mind how often you should be raising around 35, 40% of the time from the big blind. And then just try to follow the main approach that your raising range should be polarized. You don't want to be raising a hand like 9-6 suited. It's a clear check. I mean, yeah, almost always, 100% of the time. We don't want to be raising a hand like queen-7 suited. These hands are always strong enough to check. You can also just check all your queen nines, jack nines, 10 nines, nine eight offs, 10 eight offs, jack eight offs, and then you raise more of these weaker jack seven, jack six off type of hands. That's totally fine. If you play against a big calling station, then you just raise always for value. You don't raise these trash hands. You raise very straightforward, all the suited aces, even hands like queen nine suited because he's just way too sticky. This is the my main approach for bl playing blind versus blind. This is far, far, far away from playing uh, optimal. Let's say since the strategies are so mixed and the ranges are so wide, let's say if you if you if you can accomplish hundred percent perfectionism, I think if you are I don't know, just a random number, just to illustrate you the 
the way to approach it. So I would say just a random number, 10% of the population or, or average, the average player, let's say, um, accomplished 10%. So playing this bot at 11 or 12% of what is, of what would be ideal is already making you money because you're much better than your opponents, right? It's just simply not possible to, to follow these frequencies here in-game. Follow some main principles and don't try to have big blunders. Just constantly raising these pseudo connectors or always raising these trash hands. Keep in mind you will face limp jams, you fill, will face limp 3 bets, your opponent will defend against your 3 bet. And if your range is too weak, you will have too many weak C bets on the flop. Your overall range will be too weak post flop and you will also lose too much money against this 4 bet or his limp jams. So um, now let's look into our ISO raising range. As you can see here, these hands 8, 5 off, 8, 4 off, 8, 3 off, 8, 2 off, a very frequent ISO raise. And yeah, that's where I usually try to avoid applying a mixed strategy. I either want to raise this hand or not, but sometimes when, especially when ranges are very wide, it's, it's simply a game of mixing it up. And here in this spot, I decided to, to raise it up. Um, because I also think population is raising their stronger hands more frequently. I think too many people still are very unbalanced when it comes to their limbs, but it's just the way I think population plays. If, if you think, if you disagree and you think that your opponents are limping more often stronger hands, then of course you should be more careful. The flop is ace nine seven and it's, it's a very good board for my range because my range is very much ace x heavy but also con condensed or very defined around the nine seven so i have a lot of nine x hands i still have some some pairs with the seven i have some draws so also my middle part somewhat connects with this board texture so let's say the board would be ace king three i'm not raising so many king x and all my bottom part, middle part has very little equity. But on ace nine seven, my range does interact with this board texture much more. Like an eight five off has a gut shot, even an eight three off has a lot of potential on, on turns. Any 10 gives me an open ender, any six gives me an open ender, any five, any jack gives me a gut shot. So this is, this is a good board for my range here. So let's see what our strategy on the flop is. Um, first of all, within 100% of the time is supposed to check here. And we are gonna make it a little bit bigger. We are going to see bet around 75% of the time, which makes a lot of sense. It's not that we are raising all of our ASICs. We still have a bunch of air. If we would see bet all our air, we would get very susceptible against raises. Um, we also have a lot of natural checks like kings, queens, jacks uh, with, with a certain frequency. So I opted in game to go for a bet. Um, yeah, around one third. I think it's fairly standard. I don't want to get too small because the board allows him to have a lot of draws. So I don't want to give him the right price to call with like queen six and clubs, which against my range, if I bet very small, let's see what queen six and club does. Yeah, against one third, it starts folding with a certain frequency, but yeah, I'm putting these kind of hands much more indifferent than I would do with a one quarter sizing. He can almost continue with the entire range if I get too small. Uh, he only folds 18% of the time because also this board does interfere with his middle part as well. But I don't want to go too small, which then he is not really a different calling with these marginal hands, like or a queen five with backdoors is, is a very good call as well uh, against one quarter at least. So I bet one third and he opts for a call. The turn is a 10 and it's a good card for my hand, but it's also a good card for his range. So. Now the question, first of all, since it's, and that's very interesting to see, but it's not part of this video. It's such a good card for his range that he should start leading a lot of hands. Um, he will improve to a lot of straights. Uh, I don't have hands like 10-9. I don't, I don't raise hands like 10-7 preflop. Um, I probably don't have 8-6 suited in my range. Let's see if I'm raising 8-6 off. Yeah, with a certain frequency I do, um, but, but he has, more com is he com is he defending eight six off no he doesn't okay so the straight eight six off doesn't really matter but 
he has these suited two pairs. He has Jack-8 suited, which I don't. Um, Jack-8 off, I'm probably also raising sometimes. Um, but as I said, he has so ma he has much more two pairs than I do. Um, so let's see what I'm supposed to be betting here. I mean, we can also look at the EVs. So you can see that for example, with a hand like, um, let's see, maybe just even nine eight off has 60% equity now against my range. Um, so it's kind of sucks to bet and face a jam, but we block a lot of ace nines and eight six and jack eights. So it's very unlikely that we face a jam. We push a lot of equity. Uh, maybe we, we get some cards from, from queen jacks, king jacks. Uh, king queens all these sort of hands so it definitely makes a lot of sense um, uh, leading out here even though it might not feel very natural to a lot of players but if you just look at the equities here around these hands against our range that we see bet with um, it certainly makes some sense to to uh, actually we have a small and a big lead as well so mostly leading very polarized open enders, straights, two pairs. So here Pyro really likes to play his hand. If we have a very strong hand, we bet big or very good draw, then we, we just simply start betting big. Um, and betting small with the aces here, with ace five, we don't wanna bet super bad, uh, big. And um, keep in mind also some hands like king 10, queen 10, some just small merging is happening here. Um, which which makes a lot of sense. Now you might wonder, well, um, what do we do against the shaft? I mean, we sometimes also should be leading small with 10 nines, but with a very low frequency. Um, like we can easily stack off a hand like 10 eight. He can have some back to flush draws with the gutter that he's shoving, um, some straight draws. We perform very well against any ace. So I think it's a, it's a good strategy. As also here, main takeaway, Bet big with your big, better hands, bet smaller with your weaker hands. Uh, I think turn shafts as a bluff will happen very little anyway. So we don't need to be so much afraid of facing raises. Most of the time you will face a call and this is something you should spend your, the most time studying on um, the spots you're going to be most likely in, which will be a call. So. But in this situation, we face a check. So in this situation, we want to look, okay, what are we doing with our 8-3 off? And you can see it definitely does, doesn't even want to continue barreling, especially when, you're, when your range is so polarized, you don't want to barrel any backdoor equity, right? We have all the queen jacks, which also can see a king jacks, queen jacks are very natural check backs. If you barrel all your king jacks, king queens, queen jacks, some like all these draws with eight five, eight four, eight three, eight deuce, you end up over bluffing too much. It's surprising to me that three deuce off, four deuce off are also randomly barreling here. I would rather pick my eight x. So this is also something where I simplify my game a lot. I would prefer barreling a hand like. 8-5 off 100% of the time and then I check 3 dos off. I think even though it might be not be the best strategy but it simplifies I know okay I'm gonna barrel my open and straight draws even some barreling some jack 6 jack 5 off so let's say the the river is a jack I can turn it into bluff represent an 8 I will have a lot of straights in two pairs um, even though it might not have the highest EV in theory but I also want to simplify my game. Um, definitely, as I said, not 100% perfect, but you can't play 100% perfect. So I went for, yeah, around three quarters to set up a proper um, stack to pot ratio for the river. I think it's fairly standard. And the river is a 10. And I think this is where a lot of players would shy away and in, in not bluffing, especially in big tournaments. And I think this is a, a river where we should pull the trigger regardless. Remember my small flop sizing. If he has queen jack with backdoors 
he always has to call. If King Jacks have to call. And he's keep calling them on the turn. He has all the 7-8s, all the 9-8s. Uh, he can have all the 9x in diamonds, King Highs in diamonds, Queen Highs in diamonds, something like qu Queen 8 in diamond. A lot of very, very natural folds, which is always good to bluff in those spots. We're not blocking any Queen Highs, not blocking any Jack Highs, we're not blocking any diamonds, which is very, very good. We block some strong bluff catchers with like 9-8, um, um, some ace-8s. So let's see, uh, check. Oh no, sorry, I bet. He calls, turn, river is the tenant spades. And we check again, or villain checks again. And now, as you can see here, 8-3 off also. Yeah, it still wants to give up sometimes. It's like it's like a mix. Um, just because you have a good candidate to bluff with doesn't mean you want to bluff always because you might end up over bluffing, right? If you bluff all your open and straight draws. So it's, it's sometimes worth looking at. And I think this is um, also a good example where you can see that sometimes I'm I'm hero calling I'm calling more in spots where it's super easy to over bluff and to have very little over uh, value commas. So then I start calling more than I'm supposed to call in theory. You always hear me saying um, hero folding trumps hero calling in tournament poker. In brackets, it depends. <laughs> in most spots, I would say in spots where a lot of natural bluffs are possible, I'm slightly leaning more towards overcalling because it's so easy to overbluff and most people take all their natural bluffs, busted draws and good blockers, yada yada yada, and they bluff all of these combos. But they're actually not aware of the ratio of the combos they have the, the of the combos they can bluff with and the combos they can go for value with. And then they simply overbluff because they bluff all of their combos and they should actually also give up with a very high frequency. So even though you see A3 off in, in in theory or in practice, if you just logically approach it, it's a perfect bluff. We don't, we still don't bluff it 100% of the time. Um, so what we shuffle value, of course, the boats, uh, our strongest ASEX, uh, King 10s, Jack 10s that we kept betting for value on the turn. I think turn is questionable with Jack 10. I like it because our opponent has a lot of 9x, 7a, 7 jack, jack 9, uh, jack 8, 9-8, uh, 9-6, like pairs plus a gutter. Um, and we has a, have a bunch of equity against a6. So I don't mind betting for value uh, with jack 10 on the turn. Let's see. Actually, uh, jack 10 suited. Yeah, jack 10 suited keeps betting. Let's see how much equity jack 10 has here. You can see jack, jack 10 suited still has close to 70% on the on the turn. So yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of keep betting Jack 10 here. Especially blind versus blind where ranges are very wide. Don't don't undervalue your second pairs here. Uh, so bet call. Let's get back into the right tree. <clears throat> So we are going to, I decided in game to bluff 8-3 off here because I also don't have these four dues, three dues that, that just randomly barrel through. Uh, just, just some very random barrels. So again, I don't have these combos. So then I think it's totally fine to bluff most of my 8x. Um, and I still have the right frequencies, right? It's like, it's just some really random mixing. What is ha not random, of course, It's it follows some sort of strategy, but I'm not a wizard. I can't really explain now why three dues off should be superior over eight three off. I think with the turn equity we have, plus the blockers, I think I would choose these combos over these bottom combos here. Um, so I'm not spending my time on figuring out oh, why does it want to bluff three dues off? Like this is, this will make you one more penny when you figure it out, but you have to spend quite some time to figure that out. So I'd rather focus on spots that bring me more money. We can't study everything. So I went for a jam and 
I thought the only 10x that are possible are Jack 10. We blocked 10 8, which is very, very good as well. Um, and he has a lot of natural folds, so I really like my bluff here. Unfortunately, he had a very easy call with Jack 10. And if we look into his calling range when we shove, by the way, we should always shove here. Um, if you look at 8 3 off, that bluffing with one third makes you lose money a lot. But if you shove, it makes you 14.8 um, in chips. So the, the reason why I still shove though is, especially in these deeper tournaments, when we look at his calling range, of course he's calling any ace, but I think it's not unreasonable to say that he might be folding some of these ace eggs. Um, as you can see with a certain frequency, he's even calling king jack. He's calling all queen nines, almost all king nines, all nine, uh, not all nine six, but uh, all nine sevens, all ten, uh, okay, ten eight is obvious. Uh, yeah, especially the nine X and then s some nine six suited, some nine eights. And I think most players are folding it. I really think most players are folding it because they know they have all the ASICs, but since you have so limited amount of ASICs, you should actually supposed to be hero calling some of these hands as well. If you have more ASICs in your range, preflop, then it's of course okay to, to fold your jack nine or to fold your queen nine. But I think it's, a, it's very interesting to see, and I believe that in reality, especially when you run deep, and something now in order for, for a good scoop preparation, you wanna look into these spots. And if you're final two, final three turn, uh, uh, table in a, in a big tournament, I think when a lot of money is at stake, it's really worth pulling the trigger and being a little more aggressive in these spots. And not just to wait for your aces and have a good setup against kings and play it comfortable. Of course, it feels like shit busting in a big tournament and bluffing there with eight high, but this will happen. And if you're not willing to take those risks, then please also don't expect to run deep or don't cry while you constantly uh, start the short stack on final tables and you never make a final table in the first place. You always bust final two, final three tables, probably because you're sometimes scared to pull the trigger in a big spot because a lot of money is at stake. Then maybe you play the wrong stakes or maybe you just simply lack the knowledge in, in, in bluffing with these garbage hands in spots when ranges are very wide. So please take that into consideration reconsider your approach in those spots and hopefully this will help you to yeah have some really good runs in in scoop tournaments and uh also the ko tournaments on party poker and also just because the reverse is 10 remember you get called from any ace in theory you still want to be where you're shoving ace jack and ace queen it makes you more chips it makes you more money in the long run I mean, if you're on a final table and there's a lot of ICM in, in, uh, in play, you should be checking it back, of course, but we're just talking about Chip EV here. So make those jams with Ace Jack, Ace Queen. And then uh, I think it's it's very likely that you will be half, we're going to have more deep runs uh, than you would have if you wouldn't be pulling the trigger or going thin for value. That's very important. Please consider that for your gameplay. And then I wish you all the best for the KO series on Party Poker, for the Scoop series on Poker Stars. And then I see you guys at the table. Bye bye.